Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining the weekly research morning call. Today, we have banking monthly, the stock initiation, followed by the Euro technical pulse and Singapore weekly. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Glenn for banking monthly. Glenn, please. Yeah, uh, thanks, Mel. Yeah, so we'll start with the banking Monday. Uh, we'll just be looking at the interest rates firstly. So the Singapore interest rates have sort of uh, continued to flatten and the growth has declined in, uh, so the growth has sort of uh, maintained this what single basis point increase for the last couple of months and it has, is similar in August. So it was only up one basis point month of month in August to 3.69%. and But nonetheless, it has still surged 227 basis points here on year and it's also still seven basis points higher than the second quarter to three average of 3.62%. So while it's still a very sort of a, a slow increase, but we can see that it's still inching up slowly. So for the Hong Kong interest rates, um, it has actually declined and it has slightly reversed the previous few months increase. So that's in the blue line there in the chart. So it was down 12 basis points one a month to 4.98%. And this is a reversal of July's month on month increase of 26 basis points. But nonetheless, this is still the second highest that the three month high ball has reached for 2023. It has improved by 256 basis points year on year, and it is also still 70 basis points higher than the second quarter average of 4.28%. Now, moving on to the next slide. Yeah. yeah. So for the Singapore loans growth, the overall loans growth has uh, has fallen, has continued to dip, and it fell by 6.15% year-on-year in July. And this is below our estimate of a low single-digit growth for 2023, as the rise in interest rates start to be more fully felt by the consumers. So this is actually the highest uh, sort of decline that the loans growth has reached for 2023. So for the two main segments, the business loans, it also fell by 8.75%, with the largest segment in this business loans uh, which is the falling by 22.75%. This is to the loans to the manufacturing segment, while the building and construction segment, which is the single largest business segment, only fell by 2.46%. But the other one is the con consumer loans. It only fell by 1.84%, as the dips in the other segments were offset slightly by the strong loan demand in the housing segment. So the housing loans make up around 70% of the consumer lending, and it grew by 1.09% year-on-year. So the, the, I think the only bright spot in the loans growth would be this housing loans, which has, has continued to grow for the last few months. So for the total deposit and balances, it grew by 3.25% year on year in July. And the current account and savings account proportion was flat at 18.9%. So it, has been, it hasn't been declined for the last, I think, three months for this current account and savings accounts or CASA proportion. So this CASA is very important to the banks as you know it is sort of their cost of funds. So if it if it if this CASA dips, it means that their cost of funds is, is you can technically say that it's increasing. So we can see this cost of funds uh, or their CASA maintaining at these levels of around 19% for we, we should foresee this maintaining at 19% at least for the next few months and for the rest of the year. So we can sort of see that the, the bank's cost of funds have stabilized at these levels. And it sort of reiterates what they have been saying also in the second quarter results. So for the Hong Kong loans growth, it declined by, it continued to decline and it fell by 4.73% year on year. And it also declined 0.98% month on month in July. Now moving on to the next slide regarding the SGX statistics. Yes, so the preliminary SDAV for August, it fell 4% year-on-year to 1,061 million. And this is slightly reversing the year-on-year -year increase in the previous month. Whereas the VIX averaged 15.9 in August, and this is up from 13.9 in the previous month. And the VIX sort of shows the volatility and it has sort of risen due, mainly due to the, the China worries. And while the DDAV fell 1% year-on-year, to 0 0.98 million in July. For the top four equity index futures turnover, it saw an increase of 7.1% year-on-year in August, 
And this was mainly due to higher trading volumes of its FTSE Taiwan index futures as well as the FTSE China A50 index futures. And notably, the FTSE China A50 index futures it rose by 17.8% month on month. Now, for some banking, uh, Singapore banking news, I think you have three uh, points, three news that I'd like to bring up. The first one being that it was on it was reported that the DBS as well as Bank of Singapore were creditors to investment companies which were linked to the individuals arrested and charged earlier in August over the $1 billion money laundering scandal. But however, they haven't released much details about this, so we don't know uh, how much they, they, have, they are involved in. So I think we just have to wait for more news to come out. The second point is that the um, OCBC actually suffered a short outage on 28 August, which affected their digital and card banking channels. But nonetheless, it was about an hour later, they actually resolved this. So we also have to wait and see if MES would like to take any action and maybe uh, give a, a fine to OCBC. But I don't think it will affect them that much. And the last point is that... Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> The MES actually announced that it will commit up to 150 million Singapore dollars over three years under their renewed financial sector technology and innovation scheme or FTS, FSTI 3.0. So the next slide, please. Yeah, so as such, we maintain overweight on the banking sector and remain positive on the banks. The bank dividend yields are attractive with upside surprises due to excess capital ratios, as well as a push towards higher ROEs. And Singapore, SGX is also another beneficiary of the higher interest rates. That's all I have for the banking sector. I'll now hand it over to Meow Meow. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. So I initiated coverage on Suntech Rate. It's a commercial rate with office and retail asset and market value of 3.5 billion. It owns several grade A office buildings such as Suntech City, one third staking one Raffles or uh, one Raffles Key and MBF Theta One Two, uh, with sixty six point three percent interest in Suntec Singapore Convention, and full ownership of Suntec City Mall. Suntec also um also owns the integrated uh commercial development known as Suntec City. So ALA Trust Management uh, Limited is appointed is the appointed manager, and Suntec has a diversified portfolio across geographies with 69% revenue contributed from Singapore, 20 from Australia, and 13 from the UK. We identified three investment merits. Firstly, is his healthy operating metrics. In first half two, three, the Singapore office achieved overall occupancy rate of 99.3%. Occupancy for Suntec City Mall remains stable at 98.3%. Well, rental reversion experienced a noticeable increase of 18.2% um, young year. Tenant sales achieved 108% of the pre pandemic level, with the expectation of further enhancement upon complete recovery of international tourism. Furthermore, recover revenue for Suntec Convention surged 95.2% young year to 83.7% of the pre pandemic level. And the management is confident that the revenue will gradually recover back to pre COVID level in FY24. Secondly, divestment over equity fundraising to lower is gearing. In first half two straight, Suntech has successfully sold three strata units in Suntech office, summing up to around 10K square feet, with at least 20% above book value. Proceeds from the sales were about uh, 40 million. Suntech is also eyeing on potential divestment for mature assets, such as the 477 Collins Street, with the target with the target of lowering gearing to 40%, Suntech need to divest around uh, 200 million more of the assets. Last but not least, valuation is near record low. Suntech is currently trading at 0 0.33 standard deviation below the main and 0 0.57 um price to NAV, which is below the average of S rate, um 0 0.86 um price to NAV. Despite the hike in Singapore 10 year bond yield to 3.22%, Suntech is still, still trading at positive spread of 2.33%. Suntech can be benefited 
the most from the interest rate cut due to its low fixed rate debt of 58% versus its peers 76% of capital rate, 78.3% of MEPAC, and 78% of CICT. Well, as for the investment merit, as for the investment risk, first is its currency risk. Despite the foreign currency income hash to up to 63% as of first half two three, Suntec still generates 33% revenue in other currency, such as GBP and AOD, and need to convey to Singapore dollar for dividend distribution. And the next one is income uh, income risk. We see some cases of tenant downsizing or defaulting in certain area, such as minister building, receive a 1 million break penalty for early termination in first half two three. The building is, expect, is expecting a 6% vacant space in FY24. As such, we initiate coverage on some tech rate with a buy recommendation and target price of 1.48. $1. Our valuation is based on DDM using a cost of equity of 10.4% and 1% terminal growth rate. At the current share price, Suntec is priced at 5.64% of the FY23 DPU or DPU yield. Yeah, that's all for Suntec. I'll hand over to Zane for the technical pass. Thank you. Thanks, Mel Mel. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'll move on to the technical section. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so for the S and P five hundred, uh, last week, um, there was a rebound, but it was it was met with some resistance at the four thousand five hundred thirty level, which was actually a prior uh horizontal support, which was broken down. So it was a retest. Uh, currently finding some resistance over there. So for now, we could see some sort of a range bound trading, uh, this week since at the four thousand five hundred fifty level, currently it's around the twenty day moving average as well. Let's see whether the price is able to hold at this level, or if if not it might go a little bit lower as well. Yeah, so for this week, you can see some resistance at around 4,500 to about 4,540, while the immediate support could be at 4,380 to about 4,450 area. Uh, next slide. So I uh, released a report on, uh, on Thai SDR Monday for August uh, this morning. So um, the table captures the summary of the, uh, these three uh, but the performance of the three Thai listed counters in August. So the three counters are airports of Thailand, uh, CPO, as well as PTT exploration and production. And uh, for August, all of them actually were in the green, uh, gaining about between one to about 3%. Yeah. And we also saw increased uh, trading volume in August as compared to July. So as for the current trend wise, um, Airports of Thailand as well as CPO are currently in a bit of a range consolidation, while PTT exploration and production is in an uptrend. And in terms of outlook wise for September, we could see the range bound trading continue for the two stocks. As uh, for Airport of Thailand, likely is to find some sort of resistance close to the 7350 uh, Thai baht level with a uh, lower swing highs form uh, since uh, December of last year. As for this, as for CPO, um Range bound trading could, could be observed as well with a uh, lower swing highs observed, uh, forming since January. Also, uh, with a retest of the uh, with a recent retest of a double bottom formation, um, we could see some sort of price uh, price volatility uh tightening the hit. As for PTT expiration, uh the price action wise is still quite bullish. If price continues its the recent momentum, it could go on and test the next resistance area around 170 to 173 time bar. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is the chart for airports of Thailand. So for this, uh, resistance is between uh, 7350 to 7650 baht with the support at around 69 to 71 baht. Uh, the stock last close at 71 baht on Friday. So for this, uh, in terms of the trend wise, it's still kept, in, it's still trading within the rising wedge formation. But you see in terms of the chart wise, it's just a uh, horizontal, it's just trading in the horizontal range recently. So that could actually continue if you don't see any break above the resistance of 7, 7, uh, 7350 or below the support of around uh like around 69. Yeah. Uh next slide. As for CPO, the current resistance is likely between 66 to about 
50, but with the support at 58.50 to about 60.75, but with the last closing price at around 64.25, but so in terms of chart wise, um, it's quite uh, it's it's quite trading in the range for now as well. With a recent double bottom formation around the fifty eight fifty level, which was the March swing low, so if that price actually rebounded, uh, recently and tested the some resistance close to the sixty six dollar mark, which was quite near uh that a swing high as well. So if that price has actually been forming a bit of a lower high, but um the support is still holding. So if that could see a little bit of a range bound trading as well going to September. Uh, next slide. And last but not least, for PTTA, PTT exploration production, uh, price action wise is quite uh, looking good. Uh, it's still holding above the uptrend support line uh, with a breakout of, of 157 baht recently. The uh, resistance formed around May this year, which was actually a, a support level breakdown at the start of this year as well. So if that price actually broke, broke out, did a successful retest and continue to trade higher. So if that could it could go on to test the next resistance level possibly around 170 to 173 over there. So that current resistance possibly 169.50 to 173.50 but support at uh, 157 to 163 but the stock last close at 167.50 but on Friday. Uh, next slide. So in terms of uh, individual counters, uh, for new, we have a technical buy at uh, eleven dollars. We take profit levels at fourteen dollars as well as fifteen thirty with a stop loss at nine fifty. So the stop loss goes at ten uh ten oh four on Friday. So new um after retracing from the downtrend channel resistance, uh it actually tested the, around the ten sixty level where the group uh it started to trade in a range. Uh, it back tested the downtrend resistance line shown in the chart as well as a previous uh, horizontal res resistance level breakout. So if price actually finds support during this range consolidation, it could potentially uh, do some uh, do a rebound to test the $14 resistance level, um, which was a, a recent uh, horizontal support breakdown recently during the pullback. And possibly 1530 as the next target level, uh, which could be the down a retest of the downtrend channel resistance. Uh, so that's all from me now. Uh, I'll pass on the time to Paul to talk about his uh, visit to Food Empire. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, uh, th thanks, Zane. So uh, I'll just update for the uh, planned visit that we did to uh, Ho Chi Minh City uh, for with, uh, Food Empire. Um, so, so in terms of the, of the highlights of the meeting, uh, so we we, we so uh, food empire has been in uh, has been in Vietnam since 2013 under the McCoffee brand. So since then they built up. Uh, so what happened to the slide? Uh, can you go back to the slides? Yeah. Since then they they built up a 14 percent market share, uh, in a 400 million market. So you can now uh, kind of guesstimate their uh, revenue is about 50 million. So when they started. Uh, into this instant coffee business, uh, it was under is a under this key key three in one brand called Cafe Four. Uh, the market was really quite competitive, especially you have Nest uh, Nest Cafe there or or Nestle. So what what differentiated them was that they they targeted themselves as a best tasting coffee served with ice. Now, of course, the question is why ice is because in Vietnam, uh, seventy percent of the consumption of instant coffee of coffee is actually done in the ice form, especially in southern uh, Vietnam. And they also uh, had a deep penetration into the street shops so we will have a picture later. So that's one of their strengths. It's actually the, the general trade, not so much the modern trade because that's uh, extremely tough to compete in. So we think there'll be three drivers of growth for them. Uh, there'll be organic growth because instant coffee in line with the Vietnam GDP is also growing 3 to 5%. Uh, second is market share because they are very strong in southern Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh, but uh, they try to, to target and penetrate more into north uh, Vietnam. And there will be also new products. So one of them that they hope to even export within the region, in ASEAN region, is uh, is uh, this bubble bee, uh, instant um, bubble, bee, uh, bubble tea, sorry, bu bubble tea beverage, which we'll show later. Uh, the current conditions are weak. Uh, in Vietnam right now, uh, it's not in the it's not in the slide. Sorry, the, in Vietnam right now, the current conditions is being uh, in line with the weak macro environment. 
So once it's all in the report, but I mean, once the economic conditions are weak, in terms of what happens to the consumer, uh, number one, the consumer will be more promotion sensitive. They will trade down more. So there's more price competition. Uh, number two, they will be less willing to try new products. Uh, 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 these are some of the, 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 the unique features when the economic conditions are, are weak. And the, the third thing is that they will hoard less. So once economic conditions is less, uh, the consumers won't buy so much and stock up in their pantry. So there'll be less pantry loading. So all this will affect sales. So this year will be weaker than the prior year. So in, in terms of the consumer, the market share, uh, the big instant bands are like Nescafe, G7, which is uh, old coffee, and Mac Coffee is their own brand name under the Cafe 4 uh, 3 in 1 coffee. Uh, the, uh, the, the other thing is that um, the, in terms of the profile of the consumer, uh, it's usually the 35-year-old and above will consume instant coffee. The young ones normally don't uh, will only consume coffee in the coffee shops uh, because maybe two-thirds of the market of cost, coffee consumption is consumed in the coffee shops. Uh, which, you know, if you go around Vietnam, you can see all these small coffee shops. Uh, the other thing was that uh, the, in the pandemic, they did very well because many coffee shops were closed and then the consumption shifted to homes and there was a lot of pantry loading. Of course, this is not unique to Vietnam. It's happening here too. Uh, production was set up to 205. So they've been around in Vietnam for uh, since 2005 in terms of the factory. And I mean, they are, they are really long-term players trying to build a brand in Vietnam. Uh, in terms of the products, they also launched this new uh, bubble tea, uh, which, which is actually quite quite nice to drink uh, and this is really grown to a, a, a few million dollar category for them uh, they're exploring it to, to sell it uh, uh, in the ASEAN markets uh, other ASEAN markets uh, next slide so the, uh, these are some of the pictures in, as per the report so the, the picture on the left is uh, you know, not some of those small sundry shops so they are dominant because once you go into the sundry shop I think the coffee probably hit your face uh, because it's everywhere. You can see they have all their products in front. So the thing is that why would the why would the 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 vendor want to display their products, whereas the competitors are all hidden inside some dark place inside? So it's because uh, they have their own sales force. So they invest a lot on distribution. So each salesperson may they got like nine hundred salespeople. So each salesperson maybe visit a, uh, visit thirty shops a day to provide supply goods on a cash basis and of course to build relationship with all these street vendors so the shops that they showed us all were had this of course maybe they didn't show us the shops they didn't have but at least that i think the five or six shops that we went to was similar they went some had a poster on top displaying their products so it's a very prominent feature uh but when you go into the modern outlet you won't get this feature i mean when you go to the modern like any other supermarket there'll be so many competitors that uh, you virtually can't differentiate one or the other so their strength is really the general trade uh, and modern trade is where it's a bit very crowded. You can see from the picture in the middle. Uh, this is their bubble tea, which is uh, selling well and they hope to export within the region. Uh, this is non-rated. Uh, we don't have a, a rate, we don't have a coverage on it, but this is based on a visit note. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, I'll go through the usual weekly. Uh, in terms of the macro news coming out from Singapore is generally quite weak. So we have PMI. So PMI is Purchasing Manager Index. So it's a survey which is done in Singapore and actually quite prominent globally. They will ask the purchasing manager, you know, how, how's business are basically. So in terms of the new orders, it's, it's virtually moving sideways. So it's still contracting because below 50 means it's uh, contracting. So uh, the activity is moving sideways for manufacturing. Uh, again, the strongest part of the Singapore economy now is uh, visitor arrivals. Uh, visitor arrivals is up 80% year on year. A bulk of it, uh, we got a lot of support right now because the Chinese arrivals are, are surging. Almost 200,000 arrivals from China increase. Uh, but even if you exclude China, you're looking at a 50% jump in visitor arrivals. Uh, so that's the, probably the strongest spot in the uh, Singapore economy. Uh, retail sales continue to be weak. It's about 0.35. So it's very sluggish, uh, weakest in two years. Uh, supermarket also in July is also quite weak. It's down 2%. Uh, ho hopefully it doesn't continue because this is July is you know this is the first month of the third quarter then we're probably going to have a reflection on Sing Xiong's results in the third quarter uh, construction awards is also uh, surprisingly weak it's only 1 billion the weakest for the year so these are construction awarded by public and private sector 
then it's down 40% if you kind of, because it's a very lumpy number, a very volatile number, but even if you average out on a three-month basis, it's still down by 40%. Uh, in terms of the US, we had the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, probably the next most important person after Jerome Powell. Uh, I think our view of his comments is that I think he's probably quite happy with the current direction. Although he still says it's an open question, but I think he's happy considering that uh, he said that the inflation is moving the right direction and uh, monetary policy is in restricted stance. Basically, interest rates is high enough. So that uh, so I think our view is that it's probably going to be a pause in the September 20th meeting. Uh, imports in, in, uh, in the US continue to be weak. It's, it's another sign that global trade is continuing to be sluggish. It's the six month of decline. Uh, container volumes is actually down 26% year on year. So global trade is still extremely big. Uh, the only one sweet one sweet spot for uh, the US is auto sales. It's bounced 17. But this is after a very big 2022. Because 2022 auto sales dropped almost 8%. Uh, next slide. So I, I, I just want to go on to our usual... Um, Tactical views. Uh, we, we think the Fed will probably pause, uh, will not rate, will not uh, hike any interest rates on the 20th September meeting. Uh, 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 sorry, our first point is that we think it'll be very tepid activity ahead of the inflation release. So we think that uh, before the, the CPI data coming up in on this Wednesday, we think you no know, uh, trading activity is going to be weak because everyone just waiting for the CPI. And that will lead to whether the Federal Reserve will pause or not. Uh, we think it will be within expectations and that's why the Fed won't pause. Uh, the other tactical view is that uh, there's going to be a huge uh, fiscal boost to the Thai consumer. So in Thailand, with the new government, uh, they've, uh, they've really committed this, so they have to, to implement what they promised. So they are going to implement this thing called digital wallet stimulus. It's a quite a unique plan. So basically, they're just going to give money to every citizen. So every citizen over 16 years old will receive 10,000 baht per person or almost 400 sing dollars. So that's very nice. Uh, uh, but the unique thing is that they have to spend within four kilometers of where they stay or, or their registered address. Uh, the purpose of this is so that they will stimulate the rural economy. No, otherwise, everyone is working in Bangkok and it will just stimulate Bangkok. So it's meant to stimulate the rural areas and not concentrate. And you have to spend the money within six months. Uh, you have to spend on no... Uh, uh, household items, I guess, uh, or necessities. Uh, the budget of this is going to be almost 20, 21 billion is going to be spent or given up to citizens. Uh, the launch will be first quarter 24. So obviously, Thai Beth will be a beneficiary, but not directly because you cannot use the money to buy alcohol, uh, uh, sadly. But you can be an indirect bene beneficiary because, of course, you will boost the economy and you can actually exchange it for cash. So obviously, you can take the money and maybe use it for alcohol again. Uh, but in, uh, but regardless, I think uh, Thai Bash will have some spurt in demand in the first quarter or at least the first half of next year because this is to be spent over six months. Uh, in terms of the events coming up, uh, we will have the key one, the US CPI, and then you have US retail and China, a lot of China data coming up. Uh, I think this week we will have uh, the US listed TDCX uh, webinar and then next week we will have Propnex and Comfort the group. Uh, and, and Capital Pacific, oh, if anyone's interested. Uh, next slide. As usual, uh, oh, sorry, uh, this is just the uh, a chart of the of the visitor arrivals. Although it's 1.3 and it's 80%, is it 80%? Uh, but anyways, uh, it, it's much higher than the year ago, but it's still below the pre-pandemic of 1.7 million. Uh, the other thing is that uh, retail sales is sluggish. It's, you can see that the blue line, which is retail sales, is trending back to the trend line, which is quite surprising, considering the tourist arrivals are so coming back so strongly. Uh, next slide. So uh, our our usual uh, absolute 10 model portfolio, uh, it, it was down 5%, where's the... Sorry, it's down 5%, sorry, uh, 5% and the, the STI was actually down 4%. Sorry, there's an uh, error here. I need to fix that. Uh, the table on the right. Uh, so basically, everything was down except SCT and Comfort Delgro. Uh, across the board, I think of the index, only four stocks were positive. Uh, next slide, in August. So uh, it, in terms of the performance by sectors, you think you can see everything is negative. Uh, except industrial reads and uh, shipping here, you can see it's, it's mainly because of Yang Chichang. Uh, but banks were also down 4%. Uh, 
Uh, the one on the right is just the individual stocks. The bottom, the top half is all the small mid caps and all the stocks. Then the bottom part is all the big large cap index stocks. So you can see that the only four stocks were up, Yang Zhejiang, Citrum, Maple Tree. Uh, the losers were Venture, Singtel, Cedia, and so forth. For uh, all this is just for your reference. Uh, next slide. Uh, the the other thing is uh of course we have just to have a look at the performing assets. Uh, so these are the various assets measured in U.S. dollar terms. Uh, Singapore was down in U.S. dollar terms about six percent. Uh, REITs were down also around six percent. Uh, most performer was uh, this MSCI Asia X Japan. Uh, a lot of this is a lot of Chinese stocks are inside here. I think Tencent and so forth. So, uh, so because of the weakness in China, so that hurt. Uh, U.S. Was, uh, even though it was down, it's still the most resilient. I mean, down only 2%. And the best performer was commodities, ETF. Okay, uh, uh, all this just for reference, I think. Uh, thanks, I think we can move on to the Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I'll just take uh, the, the one, the first one that's for me. Um, yeah, uh, it asks what are SDAV and DDAV and their significance? Yeah, so SDAV stands for Securities Daily Average Volume. So it typically refers to the average volume of securities, such as stocks and bonds, uh, that's traded on a daily basis and is mostly an important metric for assessing the market liquidity. Yeah, so, you know, if the SDAV is, is up, means that uh, it's quite active uh, and that it can be beneficial for the investors. Whereas for DDAV, it stands for the Derivatives Daily Average Volume and refers to the average daily trading volume of derivative products. So it's, it's quite similar in a sense to the SDAV on the significance. So yeah, basically it's just seeing the sort of the trading activity. Yeah, hope that answers the question. Uh, I'll hand it over to the rest of my colleagues, I think. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, I think I'll just answer some questions. Um, when, oh wait, sorry, the question moved to, oh, okay, yeah, your view on CLR and, or SRT, which is the two ETFs, I believe is the uh, Lion, Philip, and the IH REIT Index, against investing in individual REITs. Yeah, so for this, uh, you have to look at your investment, uh, kind of your tolerance, if you are more of a risk taker, then, I would suggest you would uh, kind of do some stock picks and invest in the individual REITs that you think would uh, have a, like a bigger dividend yield and more capital gains rather than investing in the ETF. But if you are more of a passive investor and you don't like to uh, keep uh, like continue tracking the individual shares or stocks, yeah, then I would just recommend you invest in the ETFs, either the CLR or SRT and just collect the dividends rather than investing and paying more so much attention when you invest in individual REITs. Because you have to monitor all these uh, shares if you invest in individually. Yeah, but then of course for ETF, you have to pay a slight fee for the management and then there's this tracking error, all these. Yeah, so yeah, but it's just uh the pros and cons of investing in ETFs versus uh, individual shares. Yeah, so I can't really uh, suggest whether you do either or, but uh, yeah, it's based on your risk uh, tolerance. Um, yeah, can you throw some light on the current performance of Escort Re the uh, Capital and Escort Read, which is a CLAS, and is your analyst bullish on the read? Yeah, so uh, the analyst is me. We have a buy call at target price of one one twenty, and uh, that's uh, the the current share price basically is down because of the equity fund raising. Like we saw in the most recent a few equity fund raising events. Like Ascenders, Capital Land, Escort Trust, uh, for example. Yeah, the market didn't take the, the EFRs too well. Yeah, and now the share price for CLS is even below the uh placement price and the, the EFR price. But we believe they'll the that near term there'll be some weakness as uh maybe uh, those uh who fully underwrite underwritten the equity fund raising and the placements. Uh, they might be selling off their shares. Yeah, so uh, we believe there'll be some weakness there in the near term. But overall, uh, 
we we still like a uh, class because of the hospitality recovery story. Yeah, and uh, hospitality reads are the only reads that probably would uh, be able to uh, have a year on year strong increase in DPU because of the increase in ref bar. The ref bars, like uh, a lot of countries are already back to pre COVID levels, and for the average daily rates, a lot of the countries like Japan, Singapore, UK, US, etc., are already above pre COVID. So with the pickup in occupancy, we believe the repass will, will, will continue to increase. But of course, it won't be as much as uh, the increase this year because uh, the year-on-year -year increase this year was a few hundred percent, mainly because of the lower base. But then off a stronger base, uh, yeah, it's hard to see another few hundred percent increase. But the increase will be slower, but we still believe it's, uh, it will trend upwards for repass. Yeah, so that's why I save a buy call on that. Um, yeah, there's uh this question on the eye watering one point eight billion money laundering suit on Singapore in general and the property counters in particular. Yeah, so for this, I will just talk a bit about it. I'll I'll let Paul uh, uh add on. But for this, the property counters um a, a few days ago there was this uh, news that uh ten of the counters in Canning Hill. Uh, Canning Hill Canning Hill Pierce, which is a development by CDL and Capital Land, the, the private arm, yeah, is uh is part of this uh money laundering that assets that were frozen kind of. Yeah, and then so uh is they say it's stuck in limbo. So the prepayments, like the the down payments of 20% and the uh progressive payments, so the C, uh, developers have already received the money, but it's unsure whether yeah, there's cost investigations are still ongoing, right? So it's unsure whether you have to repay that amount or what will happen to that to that amount and whether the the properties will, will be sold or all this because it's still held uh by uh by the law as in they 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 they, they seize the, the properties. Yeah, so all this is still uncertain. Yeah, so we have to wait for more details. Yeah, I, I leave uh to, to add on on that. Yeah, I think which, that's off. Ah, uh, yeah. Which, which question? That's why I, I was trying to answer. Uh, Sorry. Uh. uh, what is the impact of the eye watering one point eight billion money laundering sweep on Singapore in general and property counters? Um, uh, I think hard to spec hard to speculate. I, I don't think the, uh, I don't think that amount will be a huge impact on on uh, high-end properties. The high-end properties already have their own problem, which is the 60% uh, duties. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it will probably, it can only be a slight negative to the high-end properties. I don't think it will be such a meaningful, the six, yeah, with 60%, with 60% uh, duty, I don't think there's anyone coming to buy uh, uh, high-end properties here, at least by the foreigners. Hmm. Yeah, I, I can't oscillate the number. Yeah, I don't have the exact number. Yeah, but okay. okay. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Paul. Yeah, that's all for me. I'll hand over to the rest of my colleagues. Thanks. Hi, I'll take the Lindley's question. Oh, uh, Lindley's, I will still positive. Uh, <laughs> We remain cautiously optimistic. So is FY23 revenue and NPI doubled after the full co uh, full contribution of GM and um healthy rental re retail rental reversion of 4.8%. The company is getting that um the high rental reversion is very likely to continue in FY24 with higher upside potential from Surensu at Somerset as international travelers are coming back. And also, um, one thing to be noticed of is um, at the end of FY24, Life Nation will finish con finish its construction, and it's the new lease at Greenshield. Um, its capacity is around two thousand people, and they plan to have like uh four events a day, which will probably translate into one million uh yeah one million footfall for a year. Yeah, we believe this could um further increase the rental reversion. Yeah, but the main issue for Lindley's and probably for all other reasons is gearing. 
is creeping up um quarter on quarter from 39.3% to 40.6%. Uh, due to the addition that drawdown uh, after they um had the piecemeal acquisition of a uh, parkway parade so post also post refinancing of the euro loan um the all in cost of that um uh, for fy24 could be around like 3.5 percent uh, which is pretty high for the rate yeah and also um probably for lendless is uh lacking near-term catalyst yeah, but overall, it's fundamental. It's still okay. Yeah. The next question, with regard to Suntech rate, when do you see AOD and Pound to become favorable for Suntech performance? Uh, we can't really comment on FX, but Suntech has uh, already fetched sixty three percent of its income, and um, probably will hatch more going forward. And only thirty three percent of the revenue is in current uh is in other currencies such as AOD and Pound, yeah. So um, after the hedging effect, uh, probably the depreciation of currency could be partially offset by the rental reversion. Yeah, hope it answers your question. And the uh, with uh. Thanks for initiating coverage on Suntech, right? Should investors switch from Lendless to Suntech? Uh, we don't really recommend you to switch if you are currently holding either one of the rate. Um, since switching is always like come with a switching cost. Yeah, for Suntech rate, we believe the worst is already pressed in. Uh, yeah, since they are currently one of the lowest hedged um, rates. The interest rate um hike are hitting them very badly, so the gearing is around uh forty two percent, and uh Suntech rate is very actively um deleveraging the rate with a target of forty percent of the gearing ratio, yeah, and um we also believe it will be one of the first rate to recover once the interest rate start to cut. Yeah, since the scaling ratio is very low, as we mentioned, comparing to peers like uh, uh capital rate and uh, CSAT, around 80%, 78%. Yeah, Southern Tech only has 58% of its uh, fixed debt. Yeah. Mm, yeah, there's no more question for me. And also, like, um, we believe uh cost is, uh, uh valuation is very low. Like we mentioned, it's only trading at zero point three three uh standard deviation below the historical main, and um currently the <clears throat> P two NAV is only zero point five seven, which is below the historical main of zero point seven uh seven nine P two NAV. Yeah, probably now is a very good time to enter. Yeah, hope it answers your question. I don't see any question for me. Yeah, I'll hand over to the rest of my colleagues. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Glenn, you go ahead. Oh, yeah, we have thanks for now. Maybe I'll just do the two the the, the banks one first. Okay, um, please comment on the bank stocks in Singapore. Yeah, a good question. So for the banking stocks, I think you know you're referring to the three local banks. Um, I would say moving forward, they have a few things uh, to look forward to. Firstly, is they are expecting that their name or net interest margin will continue to be high. So they actually increased their guidance for FY23, full year 23. So uh, we, it should continue to be high. You know, I mean, the interest rates, if you can see in the last couple of months, while the growth is quite flat, but we can see that there is still growth. So that is beneficial for them. And, you know, they, uh, I think they, their increase in their name will, will come to fruition for them. So this will obviously uh, positively impact their net interest income and basically their bottom line as well. But the second point would be that their um, fee income. So their fee income you know, was a bit of a dent in their earnings because it was a bit like last uh, in the second quarter. The first quarter, we saw a very big improvement and we saw like double digit growth uh, year on year as well as month on month but then we, we expected that it will continue in the second quarter and for the rest of the year but in the second quarter it sort of dipped a little bit I think it's mainly due to uh, conditions that were out of their control but they, you know, they did say that they are looking to 
continue to try to expand this fee income growth. So we could pro possibly see uh, at least a positive improvement in the next two quarters. So that will further also boost their earnings. But of course, there's uh, there's definitely a, a, a risk where you, know, you could see their provisions continue to increase. They, all the banks did increase their provisions in their in the last quarter. So we could see this going up slightly again in the next quarter. And it also, you know, it, it depends mainly on the market conditions. Okay, hope that answered the question. The second one is, can you comment on SGX in the next three to four months? Yeah, so you know, for SGX, the main points would be, I mean, they did guide down their expense. So they, will, they did say that it will be at a slower pace compared to the previous two years, FY22 and FY23. And this growth in expenses is mainly for their OTC FX business, as well as you know the base, the normal increases such as for staff costs from selling agreements, bonuses, etc. And you know they also said, uh, but so their mid term, medium term expense guidance would be around mid single digit growth. And but their capex is as do it is is expected to be higher in FY twenty four because some of it was deferred that was planned in FY23 was actually deferred to FY24. So now their range for CAPEX is around 75 to 80 million. And I think the last and the most important point for SGX would be that they have benefited greatly from the higher interest rates. And it has shown in the previous quarter, previous half, okay, and yeah, previous half, where it surged by around like uh, the treasury income only surged by 221% year on year. So this is from their uh, so, so how they do this, I think I'll just explain a little bit more, is that they have these collateral balances, which is they're sort of mandated to hold, right? And they put these collateral balances into uh, things like uh, interest earning vehicles, such as like fixed deposits, etc., where they earn an interest, but they only pay the investors like an overnight rate, you know, which is much lower. So they earn that spread. And with the interest rate at an all-time high, they will earn, a, yeah, their spread is larger now, basically. So that's how they get much better uh, their interest income, treasury income or interest income. So we do expect that this will definitely continue going into the next half as well as maybe even the next year. So in FY24. Yeah. So that is the that, that is the outlook for SGX in the next three to four months. They only release every half year. So uh, it's a bit hard to say for, for a quarterly basis. Just let me look through again and see if there's any more questions for me. Okay, that's all. Okay, yeah, Paul, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Glenn. Uh, okay. Uh, what 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 do you think of Singtel fundamentally? So, so for for Singtel, uh, not not all engines is firing. So the one that's doing well is like uh, so the associates is doing well. Singapore is flat, and the uh, Australia is is going down. So so. So for Singtel, just think of them like three parts: there's Singapore, there's Australia, and then there's the Associates. Associates is the is probably two thirds of their market cap in terms of some of the parts, which is uh, India, Thailand, and as per our previous report, uh, we think directionally that is healthy because there's uh, a price repair is another word of saying that uh, they are selling price for telcos is coming is rising. Uh, so, so we think twenty twenty four. Uh, I think you mentioned before. I think twenty twenty four should be a better year. Uh, because then they will have the added engine of IT services doing well because they are trying to re, uh, create new non-telco business that's doing well. So their fourth part of the business, which is non-telco, namely NCS and the data center, should do better because uh, NCS will turn uh, uh, more profitable because that's what they're guiding. And then uh, the data center should also be turning on uh, their large data center and that's like fully sold out. I mean, that's like fully leased out. So that could be a trigger in 2024, number one. And number two, they could be selling some assets too in 2024, like their comm center, uh, maybe selling, disposing some of the data centers. And also, uh, they might also sell some of the associates or the listed associates a little bit just to realize some value because they know that the share price is trading at a huge discount to the listed peers. Uh, because Bati might be a few billion, but people normally give a huge discount. So they want to sell a bit just to realize and tell the market that they can actually, some of these investments are realizable. And then the fourth thing is that 2024, hopefully the, the associates will, will gather more pace because the price repair is only happening probably in the second half or 
of this year. So that should do well. But the only unknown is Australia. Australia is the only part that could be dragging down because, uh, sorry to repeat myself, but Australia, the problem is that there's uh, 40 NVNOs. So in Singapore, we got 10 NVNOs, like Circle Life. No? These are uh, telco competitors that don't have the network. But in Australia, they got 40. Uh, I don't know how you're going to compete with 40, but uh, it's because they are leasing they are leasing the network from Telstra and then Telstra has the high end. Then Telstra is basically like using the MVNOs to try and take share from the lower end. So uh, Optus is in a way is being squeezed. Uh, Optus is their Australian mobile operator. Yeah, okay. I know it's a very long answer, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, the technicals I think Zane will give. Uh, uh, Tiongwon results achieve record earnings this year and growing for the past few years plus outlook also positive. Is it worth investing? Uh, so Tiongwon is giving a dividend yield of 2%. Uh, the earnings excluding the other income is probably up 20-30%. Um, I think if you want construction, then for us, we've always preferred the building material. So Tiongwon is, a, I think, crane operator. Just that there's no volume. Uh, not to say uh, Singapore stocks got very good volume, but this one has zero volume. Uh, so there's something you've got to bear with. Uh, uh, and it's obviously cheap. Uh, it's probably... The book value is 120, the share price about 50 cents. So uh, it's more than 50% price to book. Uh, but the thing is, if is that uh it looks or appears good. I mean, there's no presentation, but especially uh as the government push more PPVC, uh, which is precast buildings rather than construction work, uh, then you're doing precast. Oh, sorry for the noise. If you're doing precast rather than uh, building on-site construction, then you need a lot of trailers, you need a lot of, of uh, cranes to lift all this. So this will, will benefit them for the next few years. But the problem is there's no volume, right? hardly, there's no, nothing traded today anyway. Yeah. So it, the fundamentals look po positive, right? just that there's no volume in this stock. Uh, Paul, your positive view on PropMax, given the cooling measure and negative Singapore property, would you read this counter? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Singapore property price is, is very high chance. I mean, uh, 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 it's probably going to move sideways or even drop. Um, we really saw it in the most recent quarter because there's a lot of supply coming up. Uh, for PropNex, it's mainly because of the volumes. So, you know, PropNex depend more on volumes than on price. So, uh, like we uh, no, there's 4,000 new launch last year. This year, there'll be 11,000 new launch. So, they probably need to rely on the agent more. So, uh, uh, so we think the volumes will still come down a little bit, but uh, they are they are committing to at least a six percent dividend yield. So for me, it's 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 not like ultra strong growth. We expected some growth. We think it's going to be flat or slightly down the earnings, but they will still pay a six percent dividend yield. Uh, most important is that we like it because of their market share. So they still have like 40, 50 percent market share in uh, secondary market. So every one property, every two property that is sold. Uh, one is from Plotnex. Uh, I mean, this is more like marketing sp spin. Uh. <laughs> uh, but but that's one of the reasons that it's a bit more defensive uh, for us also. Yeah. But because it's very hard to find any growth these days in the market. Yeah. Uh, so can... Uh, okay, we content on Tiangmoon. Uh, Paul, the Genting Singapore, uh, the Chinese tourists are not coming and the Chinese gone really bad. What's your view? Oh, they are, they are coming. Sorry, maybe if I... Sorry if I might have presented wrongly, but uh, Chinese tourists is definitely coming. Uh, last year, the Chinese arrivals was, I think, less than 20,000. Uh, 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 last year, this month, in August, last year was less than 20,000. In August, it was 200 over 1,000. So it's up like 10 times, more than 10 times, the Chinese arrivals. And I think they should benefit Genting. Uh, I guess there's, there is such a thing as pent up demand for gaming. Yeah. So, so I think Genting will, should be a beneficiary of the tourist arrivals. Uh, local construction industry can be a safe haven given the tech and other China slowdown. Any insights? Uh, uh, again, for construction industry, we uh, uh, for those who heard it many times, we always prefer the building materials uh, because building materials have about 40 to 50% market share uh, like Pan United or BRC. So those are the better ones to play. Yeah, uh, that's our view. And and like we highlighted, uh, construction, yes, I think we do agree it can be uh, defensive because I think the BCA is 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 forecasting uh, construction of water, although it's been slow this year, but construction of water to, to be stable around 24 billion, I think. Yeah. And yeah. And because, you know, so there was so much delay, especially during the pandemic. 
Uh, crane companies are doing well recently, like Singhing and the, are they worth looking? Yeah. Uh, just that we never met them, so I can only say from memory. Uh, but the move to PPVC, I think I think the new all the new GLS, I think you need to use PPVC if I'm not mistaken. I think uh you can uh Peggy is our construction analyst, so you can ask her next next week. Uh HR net, any growth in view of the strong demand in manpower? I think it's gonna be sluggish year for them. I think the, the second half uh is gonna be sluggish. Uh, they did well last year because the, there was the pandemic demand and there was a lot of semiconductor demand. So this year is a bit of a stabilization because they're going to not have that extra demand. So I think this year, year on year, you're going to still be weak. Uh, on the REITs, I think this one Darren will mention. Uh, okay, your views on uh, Hourglass. Oh, okay, so for Hourglass, uh, I, I did go to the AGM. I think I did do a presentation. But anyway, uh, I think they are a bit more cautious for our glass uh, because what they mentioned is the secondary prices for watches is coming down a lot. So they were they are a bit more, more cautious this time around. And if you look at the Singapore numbers, the watch sales actually come, come off, although tourism is coming up. So uh, the main takeaway is that uh, secondhand prices for watches is down and uh, they are a bit more hesitant and also because of China's slowdown. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but again, you know, uh, you want to buy a Rolex, everything is on allocation. So their strength is that they are the authorized distributor, which is an uh, exclusive club of people that can sell all the luxury watches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But just the near term will be a bit more challenging uh, because the because a lot of the buyers are all those dealers too. So the 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 uh, the volume, the bulk buyers, but if the secondary price comes down, then you might not get these bulk buyers coming in. That was some of the main takeaways. Uh, yeah, but our glass, I think their annual report is a very good read. They actually give a very good sense of the market. Uh, government savings bond, or I think this one I'll leave it to. Uh, Netlink good buy in terms of dividend. Yeah, I I think for Netlink, the dividend yield of I think now is six percent can sustain at least up to twenty twenty five. Uh, twenty twenty six a bit tricky because twenty twenty six they have to refinance their debt, which they are paying at I think one percent plus. So I think they're going to get hit by higher interest expense only in 2026. But the next one, two years can still enjoy the 6% dividend yield. Uh, and, and you know, like uh, and the unique thing about uh, business trust is that if they want to maintain dividends, they can actually borrow a bit more. Uh, it's not a good thing, but they're allowed to do it uh, because it's a business trust. Well, not like read, 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 you can't because you have to take from distributable income. But their definition of distributable income for business trust includes borrowings. And Capex too, of course. Uh, please come comment on Sam Cop. Uh, Peggy is the one covering, so uh, I don't have any particular view. Sorry, uh, the way for her, but uh, but we think uh the power price, the tight power demand, uh, the tight uh power, the, the sorry, the tight demand supply conditions in Singapore should continue until um twenty twenty five. That means even next year, you should have very still maintain the margins because. Uh, there's no new supply, uh, new new generation supply until 2025. Uh, I think Singapore even has to import power from Tanaga. I mean, so it kind of shows uh, how tight the supply is. Yeah. Uh, can we try to invite Tiong Boon webinar so that more... Okay, I, I can try. It, it, sometimes it's not because we don't try. Sometimes it's just that they are not just totally not interested. But, uh, uh, but I, will, I will send them an email and then see whether they are interested to attend. Can you call it Delphi? Uh, I'm not sure if I attend. Uh, Max, you went and uh, attend Delphi, is right? Yeah. I, I will answer one last question on the chat side. Uh, do know if you can post your questions in Q&A, it'll be, it'll be good. So at least we, we won't miss. Uh, what's Philip's view on Chinese economy as a result of the lower FDI, de-risking high employment rate, the estimated property sector debt mounting? Yeah. So obviously, China is facing a huge property deflation. Uh, we still think there will be some stimulus, uh, but, but uh, I, 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 uh, but it's going to be hard to stimulate the property sector with more debt, because they're so heavily leveraged. So, uh, our general conclusion is that, um, the stimulus, uh, will come, although it's a bit delayed, but it won't be a huge one because they can't stimulate and then cause more further debt issues. Um, It'll be a bit more of a tactical. Uh, the new, you know, the new government or the new team is only in 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 March, so I guess it's going to take some time for them to announce stimulus, but which is already happening. Uh, but the general view is that 
uh, in uh, China accounts for 30%, roughly, you know, depends on the year. But in general, China accounts for 30% of uh, 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 the net growth in, GD in global GDP. So without China, then I think global GDP is going to be quite weak. Uh, it, because if I know everyone likes to bash China, but if there's no China, if China doesn't grow, it's going to affect the whole world because they account for thirty percent of any the the growth that we've been experiencing globally. One third of it comes from China, and I think maybe that's that's why uh, the US is maybe trying to warm up to China because they know that that their economy is slowing down. They cannot have China also slowing down, especially into an election year next year. Yeah. Okay. I, I think I'm done. I think the rest can you all uh, answer some. Yeah. Yeah, I'll pick up some of the other questions. Um, yeah, please comment on Singapore is going forward. Yeah, so right now, uh, like Paul and Mel mentioned earlier, uh, that the the interest rates are still quite elevated and kind of higher for longer. So as the the REITs kind of reprice the their loans, that the they will feel the impact of the higher interest rates uh within the next one or two years. So like for for SunTech for example, because their hedging is lower. So the the they felt the brunt of the high interest rates really like it was so, uh, seen in their uh, financials in the past few quarters, but for a lot of the REITs, um, the full impact is not felt yet because of their high hedging ratio. So uh, going forward, uh, REITs will will still be challenging, but we like it uh, from a relative standpoint where. Now if you compare it, there's another question. If you compare it to the Singapore government savings bond, the, the yield spread is uh towards the mean now is about two percent the yield spread. Like so so we think is um oh where's the question? Let me see. So we think uh, yeah, the Singapore government savings bond at 3.1 percent or S is better in current environment. Yeah, so if you are a complete risk adverse investor, then of course you have to invest in the Singapore government's savings bond, as that is as good as zero risk. But if you want some, yeah, kind of, if you are higher, if your risk tolerance rather is higher, yeah, investing in S-Rich right now is a good time because um, of, of the use spread is back to its mean and the, the risk really uh, kind of corrected recently. Like it kind of fell, it fell quite a bit recently because of all these uh, high interest rates and the Fed being more hot face and, and such. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, based on your risk tolerance, high risk adverse, basically just invest in the Singapore government savings bond. But you have your higher risk and you like some equity, like the equity risk premium, you can invest in the Singapore REITs. Uh, top three REITs with returns. Um, so the the REIT with the highest return that we have is uh Prime, but we we know that Prime the the US of this market is still quite weak. If higher leasing. Uh, I mean, uh, slower leasing volumes and higher vacancies, but based on return, yeah, the top read is a prime. Uh, but do know that we, although we have that target price, we we know that a lot of headwinds and it will take a while before it, uh, uh, the US market recovers. So if you are a long term investor, yeah, prime prime, we we believe is our topic. But it's not for auto short term uh kind of trading. Yeah, of course, the, the sentiment is still quite weak there. Um, there's one more, but I can't... Uh, yeah, any... Yeah, so uh, thoughts on CLI. The TA part, I'll leave it to Zane. Yeah, for the FA on CLI, do you like it because of its uh, fund or fee recurring income structure? And because of the, the lodging business, the lodging business is doing exceptionally well now. With a lot of uh, demand for travel and and such, yeah, we saw a year on year increase of a high double digit percent for their lodging business fee income and uh, both the fee income side and the uh, investment management side of the lodging. But uh, the China side is still weak for CLI, and based on valuations, uh, we have a target price of three sixty eight, three dollars sixty eight for CLI. Um, is is trading now at about. Uh, three dollars. So it's yeah, it's actually a big discount to our uh some of the past target price. Yeah. So uh, basically, we like the the fee income structure for CLI. So yeah, we have a buy. 
Yeah, that's all for me. I think you can hand over to Zane already. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think I'll take the oh. Delphi question. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh I attended the Delphi briefing. Uh, just, but just as a disclaimer, we don't cover this stuff. So hmm. one of the most one of the few interesting things that they mentioned during the meeting was that they continue to gain share, particularly in Indonesia and Philippines. And this is mainly because of several reasons. Uh, firstly, it's because Delphi is kind of focusing more on healthier snacks. So it is kind of like, uh, you know, Gen Z and Gen Zs are more kind of like into more, more into healthier snacks. So which is why they can increase their market share there. And then secondly, it's also the because they're also selling more of the products in convenience stores instead of just your normal supermarkets. So why this benefit them is because in countries like Indonesia, they are, the government is building uh, more and more highways. And because of this, there will be more and more rest areas. And as a result, there will be also more convenience stores there. So, you know, as people travel more through the highways, they will stop by more of those convenience stores and therefore definitely can sell more of their products there. And then um, I think the other ones that is also interesting is also that uh, Delphi says that they are downsizing their SKUs. So what we mean by this is that, for example, if they used to sell their products in like in a packet of 20 packages, for example, they just sell it into like five and then make it cheaper for consumers. So it is more accessible. But at the same time, these, these products are also has also, ha also has higher margins for Delphi. So it kind of like benefits them both in, 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 in it, it kind of benefits the company in both ways as well. Then, um, yeah, I think those those are the, some of the most uh, interesting points that for Delphi uh, at the moment from what we get from the meeting there. And that was kind of the highlights that, during the call. So, yeah, I think I'll hand over the time to Zane for the TA part. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me just answer this last one then I, I need to go off also. Um, okay, the, the uh, Malaysia luring Singapore expats to Forest City, what's the impact on Singapore? Uh, I'm not sure if they're luring Forest City. I think they, they can try, but they get stuck in all the bad jam. Uh, I think the the bigger threat is probably the RTS. Uh, because the the rapid uh the rapid train between uh Singapore, I think between Woodlands and uh and Johor, that, that is a that is a bit more interesting because uh, uh those who want to to if it if it's really because it's under construction. So there's a lot more interest in the property at the Joho site where the RTS land rather than Forest City. Uh, Forest City is on, on the second link. So I think rather than... than and and uh, expert, I'm not sure because expert will probably be a rental market. Uh, and most of the Singapore property, you know, 90% is all first-time home buyers. So I don't think uh, Forest City... And I'm not sure how many people want to buy a property from Country Garden now. So I'm not sure... Uh, that, that there will be much of an impact. Uh, again, that's my own view. Yeah. Uh, last one, can you comment on Olam for short? Uh, okay, so for Olam, uh, the stock was all about doing the IPO um, and uh, which is going to be listed in Saudi and also uh, 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 Singapore. Uh, again, we, we really have no, no clue whether uh, if you're buying it, you're just hoping for that. But again, we don't have any insight where this happened. Just that the share price got hit very badly because the results is, uh, was was hit uh, by the high interest expense. Uh, you know. It also means that they need to do this IPO more urgently. But again, sorry, I got nothing, no, nothing really uh, valuable to add. Uh, yeah. Okay, I hand it over to you, Max, and then uh, you can close it also. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Uh Thanks, Paul. Uh, I think I'll move on to the technicals. Uh, let me just share my screen right now. Okay, so uh, to begin, uh, I'll talk about Full Empire. So currently, I think it's attempted uh break of this uh trend line resistance over here. Uh, price has been moving sideways over here for now. So um, nothing much has happened. I think uh currently could still be in a range. Uh, there's some good support. There's a uh, price is still supported above the one dollar level over here. The, the support is still okay. But for now, there still could be some resistance nearby around the one seven level onwards. As we see over here, there's some lower highs being formed. 
So with that, uh, for prop for proper reverse outputs, you can see the the high the low high over here being taken out. So yeah, for now could be still trading a bit of a range consolidation over here for for full empire. Then next up for Delphi. Delphi recently test tested the support over in over here again around 118, still holding. But uh I think yeah, there's still some lower highs being formed over here. So over here in this stretch, there's still some weakness, weakness here. Uh confirmation will be the breakdown of this this support here. So for the for now could still be just holding on in a bit of a range over here. Then for it to turn strong again, you must see similarly like for Empire, you must see the the this level around one two eight being uh overcome. Then you can see some sort of strength back to the okay, then next up for Semcorp Industries. Okay, for Semcorp, uh it's still quite weak. Uh the breakdown of this uh five uh five twenty seven level over here, the support. And price tested the next support level, which was around five close to five dollars. Uh, currently, then we did a small bounce, and currently we are touching it again. So, actually, the price action here suggests that it's quite weak for now. So, possibly it could extend the, the current downtrend to try and maybe test the next support level, which is around close to four eighties over here, which where it was a previous uh, range uh, resistance. Yeah. Then, uh, this could be a downtrend channel for me for up over here as well. Yeah, so for Senko industry, I think in terms of price action wise, it's still quite weak in this stretch. Okay, uh, what do you think of Singtel uh technically? Okay, uh for Singtel, I think currently could be kept in the range if the support goes. So currently uh there's a test of the support at around 232, but recently there was a the resistance came in around 236, 237, which was a prior support. So for now, if this holds, then we just could do a bit of a range. Yeah. So yeah, that's all. That's for Singtel. And uh, next up will be the three local banks. Okay, so for DBS, um, I think for now, you can see it's, it's quite obviously in range. Uh, there's, there's this uh, downtrend resistance line. It looks like it's acting on it. So to actually try and test the the size around thirty four dollars. You must go on to clear this, this level, which is around thirty three, thirty three sixty uh, about here. And you can see uh, a retest of this level. If not, maybe just continue to trade in the range. For now, then uh, if you see the break below this support level around thirty three ten, then that could indicate some weakness down to test some low uh lower support levels. Yeah. So for now, yeah, just I think it's just in the range and just look out for some. A break upwards or downwards for for TBS. And for UOB, we have recently tested uh price support uh, around twenty eight seventy. There's some resistance and price current pulling back a little, but still supported along this trend line. So could be a little some consolidation over here taking place. We see how price is going to move, whether it's going to test the highs again or or to approach the swing low. Yeah, so let's see how it goes again for UOB. Looks like a bit of a consolidation for now. And similarly for OCBC as well, I think the three banks are behaving quite similar for now. Uh, there's this trend line resistance acting on it, but there's also an uptrend support line. So some consolidation over here for now, maybe price could be kept between 1240 12 to about 1260 uh, for now for OCBC. We await the next move for the three banks. Okay, uh, can and have your view on TQ5 is in downward trend, is a good time to buy? Okay, so TQ5 is a uh, Fraser's property limited. You know, if you look at the, the overall trend, yeah, it's, it's been in the downtrend. Uh, currently, it's also broke below this trend line support over here as well. Then also a lower low being created over uh, recently. Uh, in terms of the time to buy, I think currently, uh, still probably not the time yet. Uh, just maybe just holding up in the range for now, yeah. But um, let's say if it bounce, if it overcomes back 
this uh, 79 cents level, then there's some resistance upwards over close to 82 cents over here as well. And we also have this trend line resistance over here. Yeah, so yeah, in terms of buying a downtrend stock, it's quite some challenges ahead, I think, for, for this. Um, yeah, so it's quite, I think it's quite difficult to time sort of uh, time to buy unless there's a proper reversal or what. Okay, next up will be uh, CLAS. Be a percentage street. Okay, so for ascenders, I think currently uh it's still holding up in this uptrend channel over here. So uh currently price is testing uh this this short term resistance around 280 over here again. So if it if it's able to climb higher, even with this uh, higher low recently, potentially could try to test 285 again, which is this resistance that has not been broken for quite a long time over here. Yeah, so for centers over here, short term wise is still okay. Uptrend, uh, yeah. So there's a chance to test the higher resistance level. Okay, then for for Maple Tree Pen Usual Commercial Trust, I think currently price has pulled back to a level where there could be some support coming in, which is this downtrend channel, uh, support over here, close to one forty six, one forty seven. Also, this was like a a swing low back in November of last year as well. So over here could expect some support coming in for, for this stock. Yeah. And then next up is CLI, Capital Land Investment. Um I think for now, yeah, there's still some uh weakness and uh, looks like price uh the previous support around 320s over here, price pulled back upon a test uh, last week. And currently we are holding up at the support level of around 3, 3, 0, 3 0 9 over here, it's still holding. So could be a bit of a range for now. Uh, if it doesn't hold, then you go on to test the next support, which is around 3 0 2 over here. So overall the trend wise is still quite weak over here. Okay, then next up will be some uh, US counters. Uh, first up, AVGO, which is Broadcom. So Broadcom pulled back from the the resistance around nine hundred uh around nine hundred fifteen over here. So and then uh currently it's holding at the uh, one uh support level, which is around eight hundred fifties over here. So if it if it does hold, then there could be some sort of a bounce to test some short term resistance around eight hundred and sixty seven over here. If it continues to pull back, then we're likely to see the, the next support test around uh, 820 over here. Yeah, then for now, it looks like it could be trading in a bit of a range over here. The yeah, next one, uh, CRM Salesforce. Okay, Salesforce, uh, some rebound took place recently. Um, then uh recently price action looks like it's trying to get back above this level around 220 over here. So if this is able to hold, uh potentially could price could continue its uh its rebound over here in this stretch to try and maybe test closer to about 230 to about 235 over here. Okay, then for Amazon, I think currently uh it's still holding in the uptrend channel over here price. Yeah, then uh currently, but it looks like maybe just a bit of a uh, consolidation over here. Uh need to try to break above this high around uh close to 140, then uh, probably you see a continuation or uptrend over here for Amazon. Okay, next up is some uh, uh Hong Kong counters. So, what's up, Alibaba? 
Hey, Alibaba currently, uh, for the US one, uh, it's currently at the, this uh, channel support over here around $89. So if it holds, then there could be some rebound taking place um, to maybe about 92 will be some resistance possibly. If it doesn't, then it will be a breakdown over here. Then that could be something to look over here then. Uh, continuation of the downtrend in this stretch uh, and could test some lower support levels like 87 or 83 over. Okay, next up will be Meituan. Okay, Meituan has broken down all this uh, channel over here. So recently, there's been some weakness over here. Uh, currently, could, the next support level could be closer to maybe about 119, 120 over here. Yeah, then uh I think for now if it has uh if it rebounds then there should be some resistance since over here is an downtrend stretch, lower highs being formed. Uh, some strong resistance could come in around 128 to about 130 is over here. Okay, then next up uh for HKEX. Okay, HKEX uh, is still, re uh, still uh, finding resistance at this uh, downtrend channel resistance over here. So current price pulling back. Yeah, so if that continues, maybe we'll see a test of the support again over time around the 278 level, this key support. Uh, it's still, yeah, it's still kept in this downtrend over here for now. Okay, then next up, uh, menu life read. Okay, menu life read is still, still lower low thing form. Uh, currently looks like this uh, this wedge formation over here. Uh, any rebounds, I would think you need to overcome, need to break out of this uh wedge and clear this uh, recent resistance on uh six six point three cents. Then there will be there could be some rebound phase. If not, likely to form a new lower low like especially if the support current horizontal support around 5.5 .5 cents is broken uh, and then next one is prime uh prime currently some weakness the re the range over here around uh 13 point cents 13 point cents uh didn't manage to hold uh then uh, we have a new lower low forming so currently the support looks like around close to the 13 cents level over here so let's see whether that will hold yeah but it's still uh quite weak over here next one uh star hill global read uh star hill i think the very the very big trend wise uh it's like uh, it's just consolidating in this very big wedge. Uh, but for now, price has been uh trending downwards. Then uh currently looks like in a range. Uh, no new lower low form for now. So it looks like it's range power for now. We support for uh forty eight cents and resistance around fifty cents, fifty and a half cents. Yeah. So possibly trading in the range until unless we see a break either side. And that could go to uh, other directions. What's the key for SIA? Okay, SIA, I think it's still show, uh, continue to show weakness. Uh, last week, uh, I talked about the range over here. Then uh, this was, this was a, uh, it held the support around the 65 level here, but there was a breakdown this week. So if that looks like a continuation of the weakness over here for SIA, it could potentially test the next level around 660. Yeah, so 660 was like a, a horizontal level previous. There's some support over here and resistance. Yeah, so this for reference, yeah. For SIA, it looks like a continuation of the downwards momentum for now. Okay, next one, uh, in TA on acting as well as Sing Shong. 
Okay, for getting some, there's some rebound from the downtrend channel support over here around the 87 cents level, but uh, rebound back towards current 89 cents, you see some resistance coming. There's also resistance around the 90 cent mark. So it's still quite weak uh, for now, I think. Uh, small rebounds and maybe you will see a bit of a range for now if this level holds. Okay, then for Xingxiong, currently uh, after the test of this support level around 153, price trying to test this strong resistance around 157 was a prior range support. So over here, likely you'll find some resistance, I think, especially with the lower highs over here in form, form as well. With the lower highs here. Okay, then I'll talk about the TA for Tiong Wun. Okay, for Tiong Wun, uh, positive signs is that there's this uptrend uh, support line holding it over here at the, the 48.5 cents level, which confirmed with this uh, resistance line breakout. And then we have this range starting to form over here. The resistance is coming from this uh, trend line over here. So I think price is probably might continue to see a bit of a consolidation taking place. The maybe the true strength could come when there's a possible break of this break of this trend line resistance. Yeah, for two, which is possibly around the fifty one cents level. Okay, then T for Lei Chun and Citrum. Okay, for Lei Chun, uh, yes, traded outside of its trend channel over here for now. So, uh, then it's just uh keep it's just uh in a range for now. Yeah, so it looks like consolidation of you can see the volume tapering as well, tapering off as well. So we await the next direction. Uh if it breaks out above the resistance, which is a 0 0.052, the next stop. Okay, the next stop could be around the I think 0 0.057 to, to about 0 0.058. So this was previously uh swing high resistance as well as a uh, swing high resistance over here back. This was back in 2017. Yeah. Then for C trim. Okay, for C trim, I think currently uh looks like uh a, a potential double top formation over here, 14.7 cents level tested recently, then it came down. Then uh, I think now could be like uh an important level uh, at the 13.8 cents mark, which is this the main uptrend channel uh, support over here as well as a uh, uh, Break out of this uh resistance, this range over here. So resistance and support. So it is if the option uh were to continue this level must be able to hold and see some some of some sort of rebound over here. If this level breaks down, then likely the main uptrend is uh coming to an end. You can see maybe a range straight to test the the support around this swing low, which is close to thirteen point three cents over here. Okay, next up is hourglass. So okay, for, for hourglass currently, I think it's um maybe just uh, some weakness with the breakdown of these two dollars level after the range over here, then uh but over the support over here around the 190 level is still holding. So with that, um we we'll see a little bit of a range formation uh, if this support continues to hold. But there's still some there's expect some uh weakness given that uh the breakdown over here is okay, then moving back to some uh Hong Kong counters. Will be three zero three two HSI management. 
ATM. So with this, I think some witness continuing on uh, with the breakdown over here, then we test, uh, then rejected off again at the 4.2 level over here. So with that, if the momentum were to continue, we could see possibly a retest of the swing goes around 3.8, 3.9 over here. Okay, then next one is uh, JD. Okay, so for JD currently, uh, I think after the breakdown of this channel, there's also weak momentum consolidated in the range. Then uh, there was a fresh breakdown to uh, below the 128 level support today. So potentially could go and retest the uh, previous swing low close to 122, 123 over here. And then for Alibaba, okay, Alibaba, uh, something potential to look at will be this possible breakdown over here today. So this channel over here has been holding it. Uh, but recently there has been um uh, some weakness over here with this downtrend resistance line. Uh, this support and ninety three being broken and retested, becoming uh, acting as a resistance. So if it's unable to get back in the channel, then I think we'll expect some weakness from Alibaba possibly. To which maybe test that 85 or, or 8, 81 over here is next more levels. Okay, then for 10 cent also. I'm <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um Looks like it's still holding the range for now. Today we tested the you near know, the swing around 314, 315. Looks like it's still holding up. So if that holds up, then uh we'll see some continuation of the range over here. But I think it likely to be still weak since uh there's also a breakdown over here, then this could just be a range consolidation over here. And next one, last one will be uh Pingan insurance. Well, PR insurance uh, looks like uh, a retest took place recently. Uh, this strong support previously around 48 to 49. Uh, it was a test, then price, uh, then some resistance starting to set in for now. So it looks like could see a continuation of this down this downtrend stretch over here. Yeah, if that holds, then could see test some near term support level around 45, this level as well as 40, 43 and a half. 43.5, which is this single recent. Okay, then TA for Tesla, Nvidia as well as Netflix. Okay, for Tesla, I think could be kept in the range for now. Uh, previous uh support two fifty five around here acted as a resistance, but likely to see the support at around 240s over here still holding up with the breakout recently so over here looks like a, a range being formed unless we see a break above either side then uh, that could um, that could go on to the next level so if not I would expect some continued range trading for Tesla okay then Nvidia Nvidia looks like some a bit of weakness setting in recently. Uh, the four hundred eighty dollars level, four hundred eighty dollars level filled the hole. Uh, last week, then we tested. Uh, this uh confirm this swing lows are four hundred fifties as well as this trend line support. So looks like uh, if it's unable to support, then likely we'll go down to lower levels. I think for Nvidia, which is possibly a test of this trend line support again. That could bring us down to maybe four hundred thirties over here, as well as this uh horizontal key horizontal level support, which is around four hundred forty. Yeah. So if the weakness continues, we could see some lower levels being tested for Nvidia. Okay, then for Netflix. Okay, Netflix also like some potential strength recently. Uh, this downtrend channel that was put there was a like breakout recently and also cleared the recent uh, horizontal resistance. This was around 436 over here. So if price is able to hold up, 
at this breakout point, right? Uh, they say upon a retest, then I think could potentially uh continue maybe bounce higher, maybe test like four hundred and fifties over here first, then or maybe upwards of the this upward the the channel resistance over here that could bring us down up to maybe four hundred seventy. Okay, next up, uh, Jardine CNC. Uh, Jardine has been a very long period of uh, consolidation over here in this stretch. Uh, looks like it's testing the support level again. Over here, this is around uh, the, around the 3180 mark. So, um, look, if it's able to hold, then likely to see some uh, rebound back to continue the range. But something to know of will be the lower highs uh, created recently that indicate some weakness over here. Yeah, so if this level is unable to, go, unable to hold, then we could potentially see a breakdown coming for, for Jardine to test some lower levels. Yeah, so this will be important uh, to go over here. Okay, then I'll talk about venture. Okay, for venture, I think currently it's at uh, this downtrend channel support over here as well as a uh, uh, horizontal level support, which is around 1270. So this horizontal support level comes from uh, back then 2020 over here, there was a support as well as uh, 2019, there was a horizontal support over here as well. So it looks like if this level is, if this level is able to hold, then I need to could see a bit of a rebound, maybe form a range. Uh, uh, yeah, then, but then if it doesn't, then could just continue the downwards trend. Then the next potential support level uh, could be at, could be close to about 1220. I, yeah, 1220, where there was some support at this level back in 2019 as well as uh, this was like a resistance level breakout back in 2020. Okay, next up, TA for Del Monte. Okay, so Del Monte, I think, uh, has been very uh, a strong downtrend over here. Looks like, for now, looks like a, a, some sort of a rebound with a break above the resistance at uh, around the close to 16 cents mark recently. So approaching a bit of maybe some resistance at this level where there was a range being formed previously, this was around uh, 70.5 cents over here. So we see some pullback uh, consolidation. Or, yeah. If it then if it managed to if it managed to continue its bullish momentum, then potentially could go maybe test like the next resistance prior support zone type resistance that's maybe at a uh, close to 19 cents level. Uh, but I think for now, uh, yeah, could just consolidate for now since then it's been a very strong downtrend over here. Okay, next up, uh, Sun Tech Read. I think. Okay, I think Sunday rate is still uh it's still quite weak for now in terms of the TA. Uh still trending downwards. Uh recently there was a break of this range 124, then it has price came in, coming down again. So with that, uh could we see a retest of the support level recently around 118 over here if it continues its downwards uh momentum. Okay, next up, uh, T, the T for UMS. Okay, I think UMS currently uh looks like some 
up, there's an upward strength over here, but it looks like a bit of a consolidation might take place for now. Uh, yeah, so I think with potentially if there's a break of 126, if this is a consolidation wedge taking place over here, then I think that could maybe bring continued momentum upwards to maybe test the level at 130 over here for UMS. Okay, there's a question by Freddie. Oh, where can view today's seminar at Poem? So, uh, after the after the end of today, uh, today's seminar, it will be uploaded on our Philly Capital YouTube page. So you can take a look over there if you're keen to review today's uh session. Yeah, thanks. Okay, next question is on Hi Bear. Okay, Thai Bear. I think for now, uh, it looks like it's testing this trend line over here again, around the 59 and a half cents level over here. Then uh, if it's able to uh, hold at this 59 cents level over here, which was like a, this recent swing high resistance, then potentially you could see some sort of a break to test the uh, next short-term resistance around the 61 cents to 61 and a half cents level over here. Okay, then what is my view on Billy Billy? Okay, Billy Billy, I think um I think the downtrend is still quite strong over here. Uh recently it formed a range at uh at this zone over here. The then potential there was a breakdown took place, I think, on Friday itself, below the this range uh range support around 14.50. So I think I think we expect some weakness ahead. For BDB, then um uh, maybe a test of the next support around 1230s, which is this swing low over here, as well as a prior resistance. If it continues, it's downwards momentum. Okay, next up, uh, link read. I think uh, it's still continuing on its uh downwards trend. Okay, let me try to find the links, uh, some supports. Okay, so okay, in terms look, this one is like a weekly chart. So, uh, currently I think we're quite we could be quite near a support which is around the thirty, the close to about thirty seven dollars level. Prior resistance twenty fifteen, we had this uh, breakout twenty sixteen as well as a swing low created twenty seventeen. Uh, so this could be some near term support. Then yeah, recently the downwards momentum is still quite evident. Uh, after the breakdown, then we had uh, a very small range to that form over here. Uh, so the resistance is still close to thirty nine, to about close to forty dollars. Okay, for Hong Kong land, I think nothing not too much now. I think it's still still in this range consolidation still. Uh, yeah. So I think a wait for the next move upwards, where if it breaks out three sixty on the three sixty six level here could test around three eighty. If it breaks down uh three forty forty over here, then you could see lower lows, uh being formed, and maybe you could test the next support level around uh. Maybe 333 as a next immediate support. And as for EFI, this one. Okay. 
Okay, for DFI, I think uh yeah, it's still quite weak. Um, still lower lows being formed. Uh, currently we're testing uh this prior support. It was broken around two fifties over here. So I expect some some resistance to come in uh, around at this level for DFI. Okay, hi Zin. Uh, is that tech US tech review tonight? Yep, there there is. Uh, it'll be from the usual timing eight to nine fifteen. Yeah, so uh, please join if you're interested to listen. Thanks. Okay, next on uh ICBC. Okay, for ICBC, I think currently uh looks like uh, uh some rebound taking place. Um by a retest of this uh level around the 380s, which was like a prior support over here. So that it could meet some resistance. It could possibly meet some resistance at this level over here for ICBC, I think. Yeah, but I think uh for now the good thing is that uh Managed to recover back above this uh 350s level was like a support broken recent uh previously. So with that if it's holding, then maybe could see a bit of a range first and to try and take on the, the higher resistance upwards if it holds the support. Okay, uh, hi Alex. Uh, I think yeah, Monday usually I talk about the US tech counters, but uh if I think if I could raise a poll, maybe see if more people are interested in basics of TA, then maybe I could host one, then I'll I'll let I'll let uh you know again your email. Yeah. Okay, then uh for BITO, which is the this process. Bitcoin strategy ETF, so it tracks the movement of Bitcoin. Currently, I think it's still holding the price in terms of, yeah, as of now, it's still holding up the swing low support around 13. So, with that, I think nothing much could just see a little bit of a range consolidation still for now. Then, uh, yeah, some resistance could be at 14, close to 14 with this downtrend resistance line current. Yeah, I think our uh, next one will be silver and gold. Yeah, I think silver recently um. Uh, It looks like it's still being kept in the bridge over here. So I think nothing too much in terms of the trend wise. It's just range bound between 22 to about 25 uh, for now. Then in terms of gold, Yeah, in terms of gold, I think still showing some signs of weakness after the breakdown of this uptrend support line, then uh continuing on to form like um lower highs over here in this stretch. This lower high, the most recent lower high being around 1950 over here, which was like uh this uh which was like a temporary support over here. Then uh for now, the positive thing is that price is still holding at this. Uh, there is this swing low of about one eight nineties. So yeah, if could just see a little bit of range consolidation for now, if the support over here is still holds. 
Okay, so I think uh, that's all the questions for TA today. I'll, I'll pass my time to my colleagues if they have anything to add on. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so uh hi everyone. So I think uh that's all for today. Uh thank you everyone for attending uh today's session. Uh if you're keen to view the recording of uh this today's webinar afterwards, uh, you can view our Billy Capital YouTube page. Yeah. So uh that's all for today. Uh see you again next week. Uh, have a great week ahead. Bye bye everyone. Thanks.